Dairy farming in New York State is more than a way of life. Dairy and its allied industries represent the backbone of agricultural production in the northeastern United States. Cash receipts to New York livestock and dairy producers, along with the value of field crops related to livestock production, account for nearly 75 percent of the total agricultural economy of the state. Today's dairy producer must be a business manager as well as a herdsman and be alert to any factors which can reduce hard-earned profits. One of these factors is the damage caused by arthropod pests. Though flies attacking dairy cows during summer months are obvious to producers, other less conspicuous pests remain hidden from view throughout the year and are usually overlooked until long after they've caused severe economic injury. The itchiness and agitation they cause accounts for a large portion of pest-induced production losses, which are estimated to reduce milk production by 5 to 25 percent if left uncontrolled. This means that a typical dairy farmer with 65 milking cows can expect such losses to range from $5,000 to $30,000 per year. Arthropod pest pressures are also among the many stress factors that can delay the time to first calving and otherwise affect the future production performance of young replacement animals. Regular monitoring using integrated pest management techniques can help minimize animal stress caused by external parasites. The identification, monitoring, and management of these winter active pests can maximize dairy farmers' profits by correcting or eliminating problems before economic losses occur and actually lower upfront costs by avoiding unnecessary pesticide treatments. The IPM methods are easy to employ and assist producers in making knowledgeable pest control decisions. This approach involves correct identification of the pest, knowing where to look for the pest, knowing when to look for the pest, taking pest control action before pest populations reach injuriously high levels, avoiding unnecessary control actions. Lice are external parasites that spend their entire lives on the host animal. They reach a maximum size of about one-eighth of an inch in length when fully grown. The female louse lays her eggs or knits by attaching them to hairs with a strong glue to prevent them from falling off. These hatch in 10 to 14 days and the young lice mature two to three weeks later. There are four species of lice that attack dairy cattle in the northeast. Three are blood feeders and one feeds by rasping the animal's skin. All four types of lice cause extreme annoyance to the host animals. Milk production declines in heavily infested cattle and the animal's preoccupation with rubbing leads to hair loss, reduced feed conversion efficiency, and general unthriftiness. Infested animals become irritable and difficult to work with, especially during milking, so people working around lousy animals are exposed to greater risk of injury and are also annoyed by stray lice that they may pick up during handling. Most insect development slows down or stops in the fall and winter months. Cattle lice, however, thrive during the cold weather when the long hair coat of the animal provides insulation against changing air temperatures. This chart shows the normal seasonal activity of lice on dairy cattle throughout the year in New York. Note that lice are most commonly found on mature cows between the months of December and April, after which infestations drop off rapidly, reaching levels that are barely detectable by midsummer. 
In contrast, calves retain high infestation levels through June. This difference may be due to the fact that cows are placed in pasture during the spring, where exposure to the sun's rays heat the skin to temperature levels that are lethal to most of the lice. Calves, which are kept in the cool environment of the barn, are not able to take advantage of the natural curative properties of sunlight. Because cattle lice presence is inconspicuous, many producers do not detect them until their cattle begin to show hair loss from the animal's grooming activities. By that time, lice populations are well above economic injury levels and treatment becomes very difficult. Therefore, the effective management of cattle lice requires sampling of apparently healthy as well as noticeably lousy animals for the presence and relative numbers of lice. Surveillance should be conducted on a bi- or tri-weekly basis throughout the fall, winter, and spring months. Although cattle lice are small, they can be monitored on the animals easily with a little practice. Sampling involves the careful inspection with the assistance of a light source of sections of skin on a representative group of animals in the herd. A comb is used to part the hairs during the louse inspection, and a flashlight is recommended to ensure a thorough search. It is not necessary to examine every animal. Rather, it is sufficient to examine 10 percent or 15 animals each among the mature cows, heifers, and calves. Though field conditions often make an entire body search impractical, inspection should be systematic and consistent. The simplest method of surveying and scoring louse populations on cattle involves the examination of several different body regions. The best regions to check are the tail head, the hips, the back, the neck, and the head. Research has demonstrated that the neck and tail head are the two regions that are most likely to be infested because the animals cannot groom these areas effectively. Infestations of less than three lice per square inch are considered light. Three to ten are moderate. When more than ten lice are found per square inch, the infestation is regarded as heavy and treatment is recommended. Many insecticides and application procedures are effective in the management of lice. As with any insecticide application, it's essential to consult the label to ensure that the insecticide is registered for use on dairy cattle. This is especially true with lactating animals, where concerns about pesticide residues in milk restrict the types of materials that may be used for pest control. Before selecting an insecticide, consider how it can be applied to meet individual needs and production practices. There are several categories of application methods. Self-application devices, whole animal sprays, pour-ons, and dusts. Self-application devices include insecticide-treated back rubbers and dust bags. These must be placed in areas where animals will contact them frequently and treat themselves with repeated small doses. Whole animal sprays have the advantage of ensuring good coverage over the entire animal's body. But most severe louse problems occur during the winter, and it's generally wise to avoid soaking animals in periods of cold weather. Applications with foggers and mist blowers can overcome these problems. With these types of applications, a small quantity of concentrated pesticide is propelled as an aerosol, which is applied evenly over the animal's body, greatly reducing the amount of liquid used. Another method of application is the use of pour-on insecticides, 
where a small quantity of liquid pesticide is poured down the back line of the animal. The most popular application method is that of dusts. They are easy to apply, require no mixing, and can be used year-round. Most sprays and dusts recommended for louse control require a second treatment 10 days to two weeks after the first. The second application controls lice, protected in the egg stage by their thick shells, which hatch after the first treatment. Although making the second treatment may seem to be too much bother, failure to do so results in inadequate control and ultimately requires more subsequent treatments. But the best control measure against cattle lice is minimizing the risk of introducing them into the herd to begin with. When replacement animals are bought, either at auction or directly from another producer, they should be inspected carefully for lice before allowing them to mingle with other animals in the herd. Lousy animals should be segregated from other animals until they have been treated. Cattle grubs are the larval stage of heel flies. Two species of these flies occur in the northeast, the common cattle grub and the northern cattle grub. Both have similar life cycles and are serious pests which cause an estimated $600 million in losses to United States farmers each year. Though most dairy farmers have seen cattle grub warbles, few understand the complex life cycle of these insects. Adult flies emerge during the summer from a resting stage called a pupa. Heel flies are large and hairy, resembling bees. After mating, the females locate cattle on which to lay their eggs. In the northeast, this occurs between late May and August. Cattle often panic in the presence of the fast-moving flies and may run wildly with their tails high in the air in efforts to escape. This behavior, called gadding, is mysterious because adult heel flies do not bite or sting. In fact, the adults don't even feed on cattle and survive only three to eight days. Each female fly can lay up to 600 eggs on the hairs of the cow's legs and lower body regions. These eggs hatch in four to seven days and the tiny newly hatched larvae burrow through the hide into the cow's body. By November 1st, the larvae have migrated to the submucosa of the esophagus in the case of the common grub or the epidural tissues of the spinal canal by the northern cattle grub. Both species then migrate again during the winter months, reaching the animal's back by February. The larvae cut a breathing hole through the skin and form a pus-filled pocket known as a warble between the layers of the hide. Within the warbles, grubs grow rapidly for about two months, growing to about an inch in length. When mature, the grubs emerge through their breathing holes drop to the ground, and pupate in pasture litter and soil. During this stage, the grub's skin hardens and turns black. The entire metamorphosis from grub to adult heel fly takes from two to eight weeks. Northeastern adult heel flies emerge from the pupae and are active from late May through August, with June and July being the most active period. Unlike most fly pests, such as stable and horse flies, both the adult and the larval stages of the cattle grub cause economic losses. Gadding caused by adult flies decreases the cow's ability to graze efficiently, leading to weight loss and reduced growth and milk production. Gadding also makes cattle difficult to handle and increases the risk of self-inflicted injuries. Tunneling by cattle grub larvae through the cow's tissues also causes great damage. 
Young stock are more heavily infested with grubs than our mature cows because older animals develop a degree of immunity to the grub larvae. Heavy infestations in replacement animals can result in poor weight gain, delayed time to first lactation, and long-term production losses. The value of animals for slaughter is substantially reduced due to damage of the most valuable portion of the hide by the breathing holes cut by the grubs. Furthermore, the meat surrounding warbles is discolored and must be trimmed at the slaughterhouse, further decreasing the value of the carcass. For these reasons, it's advisable that farmers monitor and control this pest. In the Northeast, backs of cattle should be examined during April for the presence of warbles. These are detected by rubbing the cow's back, feeling for cyst-like bumps. When the hair around a warble is parted, the breathing hole may be visible. Because cattle develop some immunity to infestation by grubs, the most important animals to examine are those under five years of age. Calves born after the fly season and animals kept indoors during the summer will not have cattle grubs and need not be monitored. If large numbers of warbles are found, it's a warning of substantial heel fly activity in the area and indicates the treatment is warranted. During the summer, producers should also be alert to gadding behavior, an indication that female heel flies are laying eggs on the cows. Pastured cows may be examined for the presence of cattle grub eggs on the hairs of the animal's legs, udder, escutcheon, thighs, and rump. If evidence of heel fly activity is found, treatment of non-lactating animals with systemic insecticides is indicated. Cattle confined in barns from May to August will be protected from cattle grubs because heel flies will not enter barns to lay their eggs. However, individual production and management practices often rule out this method of cultural control. The most effective method of reducing fly populations is to organize a community-based, area-wide program for treating all non-lactating cattle with systemically active insecticides. Such an area-wide treatment can substantially reduce heel fly activity the following year. In the absence of regional control programs, individual producers may minimize damage to their own animals by using systemically active insecticides. Systemics are highly effective for the control of cattle grubs and are well worth the cost and effort to apply. Various chemicals are available as porons and spot-ons. It is essential that systemic insecticides are not used on lactating animals due to the danger of residues appearing in the milk. There is no cattle grub treatment available at present for lactating animals. Proper timing is critical to the safe, effective use of systemic insecticides. Treatment must be made after adult heel fly activity ceases, but before the grub larvae reach the esophagus or spinal cord. In the Northeast, this means that systemic should be used only in September and October. Treatments made after the November 1st cutoff date may cause severe allergic reactions in the animals, such as bloat, paralysis, and death. There are two economically important species of mites that infest dairy cattle in the Northeast. One, Coryoptes bovis, lives on the skin and hair of the animals. Infestation by these mites results in a condition known as Coryoptic mange, or barn itch. Coryoptic mange is generally characterized by dermatitis and hair loss in small areas around the tailhead, 
although in extreme cases, the symptoms may be more severe and generalized. Because the mites live on the surface of the skin and in the hair, Corioptic mange can be controlled quite easily by most of the treatments that are effective for louse control. Sarcoptic mange is a condition resulting from another, smaller external parasite of dairy cattle, the mite Sarcoptes scabii. Skin lesions arising from infestation with these mites are so severe that in New York, sarcoptic mange is handled as a quarantinable disease. Unlike lice and coreoptes mites, the tiny sarcoptic mange mites burrow deeply into the skin, laying eggs inside burrows, which then hatch into the larval stage. These larval mites then leave the burrows move up to the skin surface and begin forming new burrows in healthy skin tissue. The lesions that result from such infestations are a consequence of the animal's immune system reacting to the mite's presence. Because of the intensity of the animal's immunological response, even a small number of mites can produce the widespread lesions and generalized dermatitis that characterize this condition. Cows show remarkable variation to the extent with which they react to mange infestation. It's not uncommon to have healthy looking animals in stanchions next to animals with generalized lesions over much of their bodies. The first sign of mange is hair loss caused by the animals rubbing to relieve the itching sensation. Lesions on dairy cattle first appear in the hindquarters of the animal and may eventually, if untreated, cover the entire body. As the infestation progresses, the lesions become larger and bloody or moist, followed by the formation of thick, crusty scabs. When this happens, the entire hide of the animal takes on a thick, wrinkled appearance. Sarcoptic mange is only one of several conditions resulting in somewhat similar symptoms. For example, severe coreoptes mite lesions occasionally mimic those of sarcoptic mites. The only way to accurately diagnose sarcoptic mange is by having skin scrapings taken by a veterinarian or other trained professional. Scrapings are made with a scalpel by abrading rather deeply into the skin. It's best to scrape skin at the margins of the lesions rather than at the center as the mites are more likely to be found in the healthier tissue immediately next to the scurfy skin. The scrapings are then brought back to the laboratory and examined under a microscope for the presence of mites. Because of the severity of sarcoptic mange, it's treated from a regulatory standpoint as a quarantinable disease. This means that the mite threshold for placement of a herd under quarantine is the discovery of a single mite on one animal. Once a herd has been placed under quarantine, animals may not be moved off of the farm except for slaughter. Every animal in the herd must then be treated with high-pressure hydraulic spray equipment by certified pesticide applicators under the supervision of a state veterinarian. High-pressure spray equipment is necessary to ensure penetration by the spray into the skin where mites are located. Home remedies applied with low to moderate pressure gear of the type owned by many dairy producers will not provide anything more than a temporary suppression of the mites. Although farmers may be reluctant to go through official channels to have their herds treated because of the inconvenience of quarantine and treatment, attempts at on-farm control are inevitably ineffective and far more costly in the long run. Mange mites, like lice, are permanent external parasites that do not survive off of the host animal for more than a short time. The best way to minimize risk of introducing the mites into a herd is to be cautious when buying or boarding new animals. 
Avoid any animals that show visible skin lesions or that appear to be abnormally itchy or agitated. As an extra precaution, it's wise to segregate all newly purchased animals from the rest of the herd for several weeks and keep them under observation. Call in a veterinarian if any of the animals show signs of unusual itchiness. A combination of prevention, monitoring, and well-timed treatment can minimize losses and help maintain a healthy, productive, and profitable dairy herd. Contact your local cooperative extension agent or regional dairy specialist for further information on the biology, monitoring, and control of these pests in your area.